In today's lesson, we shall be looking at the superiority of the Son over the angels as demonstrated by several Old Testament passages quoted by the writer of Hebrews. The psalm quoted presents to us the superiority of the Son to the angels because of His unique status with the Father and the ministry entrusted to Him. The marriage of His incarnation, His death on the cross, and His resurrection, and the resultant exaltation have earned Him a superior name and new experience of sonship. The verses show us that God is speaking, therefore, inviting us to consider the importance of the message that is being announced through His Son. He alone can fulfill the covenant made to David of permanent kingship. His sovereign rule has now begun, seated at the right hand of God, following His resurrection after He earned us redemption and reconciliation. He is called God in the passage, but identifying Him as the one through whom all things were brought into being. There is a more complete picture of Christ in the Psalms than in the Gospels, which the author quotes to prove his point. Let us prayerfully contemplate the superiority of the Lord Jesus in His Sonship, in worship ascribed to Him by the angels, in His heirship, kingship, and eternal rulership. God bless you as you join us today. Through the Bible. Yes, this is Through the Bible. Thank you for joining us. We are certainly glad to be back with you once again through this media to focus on our study in the book of Hebrews. In our last study, we saw how Christ is superior to the prophets and we were able to appreciate the finished work of Christ and how he is seated with glory and power in the heavenlies. Well, turn with me please to Hebrews chapter 1 and begin from verse 4. Christ is superior to angels. Let me read verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Christ is superior to the angels. Angels were prominent in their service to Israel in the Old Testament. The law was given by the agency of angels. Psalm 68 verse 17, Acts 7 verse 53, Galatians chapter 3 verse 19. Cherubim were woven into the veil of the tabernacle and cherubim were fashioned of gold for the mercy seat. We find that Isaiah had a vision of the seraphim. And in the book of Revelation we find when all believers are removed there is a ministry or a service that the angels perform. Now let me be very careful. Angel ministry or service is not connected with the body of Christ. Now, are there guardian angels? Well, we really cannot get any definite biblical proof about this. Some people say, but we need to have a guardian angel. Well, where can we get that proof from? Is it biblical? Though angels protected, warned, cautioned and gave guidance to biblical characters, there is no further proof that each one of us have guardian angels. Well, my dear friend, let's be careful not to be dogmatic or make a doctrine out of matters that are concealed or unclear. Let's be very careful about that. Being made so much better than the angels. The word angel simply means messenger and it doesn't mean anything else other than that. Angels worship the Lord Jesus. They are created creatures. Christ is better than angels and that statement is made definitely and dogmatically for us in Hebrews. In the Old Testament, it is believed by many that the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the angel of the Lord. But in the New Testament, he becomes a man and having assumed human form, he does not appear as the angel of the Lord any longer. He is the man Christ Jesus. He is the son of man today. 
That is the emphasis of this Hebrew epistle. Beginning with Hebrews 1 verse 5, there is a series of quotations from the Old Testament. In fact, there are seven quotations, and six of them are from the book of Psalms. The Psalms have more to say about Christ than they have to say about any other person. It is a hymn book. H-I-M book. It was the hymn book of the temple, but it was all about him, Christ himself. It is to praise to him. You have a more complete picture of Christ in the Psalms than you have in the Gospels. These quotations in Hebrews are very important. The writer of Hebrews quotes from the Old Testament to enforce his point, which is superiority of the Son over the angels. Verse 5 For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. This is a quotation from Psalm chapter 2 verse 7. In Acts chapter 13, we have recorded Paul's great sermon at Antioch in Pisidia, in which he quoted Psalm chapter 2 verse 7. Paul said, that it had no reference to Bethlehem, but it referred to the resurrection of Christ when he was brought back from the dead. Therefore, Christ is the only one who could die for the sins of the world. No angel could save us, my friend. Only Christ could come as a man and pay the penalty which was death. The wages of sin is death. He had to shed his blood for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Therefore, he made that redemption for you and for me. Then he was brought back from the dead. Why? Because he is the Son. He was begotten from the dead. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son, is a quotation from Second Samuel. This is God's promise to David when he made his covenant with him. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son." This is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. Now, there are those who say that this one in David's line was only Solomon. Well, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5 makes it very clear that when God gave that promise to David, it had reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many arguments, pro and con, but arguments are pointless. When we have this clear scriptural confirmation, it refers to Christ, then we've got to accept it. He alone fulfilled it. Verse 6, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Let's rearrange this a little. And again, he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. This verse is a quotation from Psalm chapter 97 verse 7 and Deuteronomy 32 verse 43 in the Septuagint version, though not in the Hebrew of the Old Testament. The angels of God are wonderful, but they are inferior to the Son. They are his angels, they are his ministers, and they are his worshippers. They worship him. He does not worship them. Verse 7 And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. This quotation from Psalm 104 verse 4 The angels belong to the Lord. They are his ministers and worshippers. That's very important to see. The writer of the Hebrews, who I believe 
is Paul, is showing that Christ is superior to the angels and he is using the Old Testament scriptures to prove it. Can you see how absolutely important the first two chapters of Hebrews are? They put down a foundation for the rest of the book, which deals with the present ministry of Christ for believers today. It would be good that each one of us are conscious of the fact that there is a living Christ at God's right hand at this very moment. He is the real living Christ. It is easy to understand that angels were very important to the Hebrews because most of them were well acquainted with the Old Testament. They thought of angels as next to the very throne of God. They had read of the appearance of angels to many of God's servants and to many of the prophets. Angels were very important beings to them. There were two friends who met after not having seen each other for a long time. One of them said, are you married? The other one replied, yes, I am married. His friend then asked, what kind of a girl did you marry? Well, replied the other fellow, I married an angel. The other one said, well, you sure are lucky. Mine is still alive. Well, my friends, human beings never become angels. God has made this universe so that there are things visible and things invisible. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, we read that Christ created things visible and invisible. For example, you cannot see an atom, but it is material and it becomes energy. God created intelligences that are above man. You and I live in a universe about which the Lord has said, In my father's house are many money, meaning abiding places. John chapter 14 verse 2. Man did not come from animals. There is a material kingdom. There is the animal kingdom, the human kingdom and a spirit kingdom. There are creatures below man and creatures that are above man. We did not come from animals and we will never become angels. The word angel in Greek agalos means messenger and may be applied to a human or divine messenger. There is an order of creatures that is supernatural. And we see that in scriptures. I think it would really surprise us if we had any conception of the number of angels in the universe. They are called the host of heaven. And that means there are a whole lot of them. Their numbers apparently are not diminished or added in any way. But we have no idea how many angels there are. They have an important part in God's plan. But Christ is superior to the angels. That's the point that we are coming to. Christ is superior to the angels. Verses 8 and 9. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. These verses are a quotation from Psalm chapter 45 verses 6 to 7, which reveals that it is one of the great messianic psalms. Psalm 45 tells us that there is one coming in the line of David who will rule in righteousness. David is so thrilled about this prospect that he says, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. This is verse 1 of Psalm 45. David is saying, I could tell you about this much better than I could write about it. This one who is coming according to the writer to the Hebrews is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who will rule in righteousness. God has not given the right to rule the earth to any angel. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity is definitely a tremendous statement. Imagine this old earth being ruled by one who loves righteousness and hates iniquity. 
Wouldn't that be wonderful? Thy throne, O God. This is God the Father calling God the Son, God. Do you want to deny that Christ is God manifest in the flesh? If you do, then may I say that you are contradicting God himself. God called the Lord Jesus God. What are you calling him today? I don't know, but I am also going to call him God. I don't know about you. What would you call him? He is God manifest in the flesh. He is superior to angels because he is going to rule over the universe. He is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who is going to rule over the earth completely someday. Verses 10 to 12. Hebrews 1 verses 10 to 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. These verses are quoted from Psalm 102 verses 25 to 27. This is talking about the Lord Jesus as the Creator. These are tremendous contrasts given to us in this section. Angels are the creatures. The Lord is the Creator. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Verse 13. This verse is a quote from Psalm 110 verse 1, a psalm that is quoted more than any other psalm in the New Testament. The psalms teach the deity of Christ. There is a more complete picture of Christ in the psalms than in the Gospels. Well, a good exercise that you can cultivate is to read the psalms on a daily basis. All you have to do is to read five psalms a day and you will complete 150 psalms in a month. This would be a great exercise just to see the magnitude of information and glory and awe that the psalmists have in regard to creation, in regard to Christ, in regard to their own life. It's amazing as to how these people wrote such wonderful scriptures in praise of who God is and what he has done. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? This is verse 14 of Hebrews 1. The Bible speaks a great deal of angels. There are about 108 direct references to angels in the Old Testament and 165 in the new. The primary purpose of their creation was to render special worship and service to God. Now what are angels and what do they do? Quickly we shall enumerate some of these references to get a better understanding and appreciation of who are angels and what do they do. First things, angels are spirit beings and do not have flesh and bones but they do have bodies. Whatever heavenly form angels have, they are capable of appearing in human form. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2, we are warned to be careful how we treat strangers since we might be entertaining angels without knowing it. Then angels may also appear in other forms. Speaking of an angel at Christ's resurrection, Matthew reports that his appearance was like lightning and his garment as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Thirdly, angels are highly intelligent and have emotions. They rejoice, for example, when a sinner is saved. Angels can speak to men. You know about that. Angels do not marry and are unable to procreate. Matthew chapter 22 verses 28 to 30. Angels are not subject to death. Scripture nowhere indicates that they die or can be annihilated. A third of them fell, but they still exist as fallen or demonic spirit beings. 
Angels were all created before man and are therefore countless ages older than men and evidently number in the trillions. According to Mark chapter 13 verse 32 and Jude 6, the unfallen angels live in all of the heavens. Then angels are highly organized and are divided into ranks in what is doubtlessly a very complex organization. They are more powerful than men and men must call on divine power to deal with fallen angels. For we are told in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 and 12, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, and then, but against angels, that is fallen angels. Angels can move and act with incredible speed. Sometimes they are pictured with wings, suggesting fast travel. Some of them have names, Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer. Michael is the head of the armies of heaven. Gabriel is called the mighty one. And of course, Lucifer is the name Satan had before he fell. Angels minister to God and do his bidding. They are both spectators and participants in his mighty works, both redemptive and judgmental. They ministered to Christ in his humiliation. At the conclusion of his temptation, angels came and ministered to him. They also ministered to God's redeemed by watching over the assembly or the gathering of the believers, assisting God in answering prayer and delivering them from danger, giving encouragement and protecting children. Well, my dear friend, we've got a brief idea of who angels are and what do they do. Now we need to accept and recognize the fact that Christ is above and beyond what the angels accomplish. The Jews had a high regard for angels and they had their own traditions and writings. And here the challenge for the Jew was to think beyond what the angels do. Here he was trying to emphasize that Christ is far greater is far superior than these heavenly spirits or heavenly beings. Thank you, dear friend, for listening and I trust that you have a better understanding of who angels are and an even more appreciation of who Christ is. God bless you. The Son came to this world. He made to bring the perfect message of God, which is the salvation message. He preached and embodied. He made the nature of the invisible God visible by being incarnated as a human being and by his redemption act, he fulfilled God's purpose of salvation. Jesus has achieved a name above every name and because of his humiliation and death, his superior glory as our perfect redeemer is visible to us. He has made us co-heirs and today we can call God our father. What a wonderful privilege it is, something even the prophets never experienced. Stay tuned in to Through the Bible. God bless you. Thank you.